In our lesson tonight that looks from uh, the hymn from Amazing Grace, John Newton penned the words in the verse that we're going to look at, The Lord has promised good to me. And in that second phrase he said, His word secures my hope. These are these two lines are the uniting of a very in a very subtle way that Mr. Newton did as he put this hymn together of two important passages of scripture. One is in the Old Testament from the book of Numbers and we'll look at it uh, for a little bit this evening. The other is a passage from the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 6 and we'll look at that in a little more in depth in just a little while. But Mr. Newton weaves these two together to help us to understand a great thing about God's amazing grace. How it is the assurance for our future and how that God's own word is that which secures that promise for us. I want us to imagine, if you would, some people who are at a crossroad. Maybe you've wandered in those woods like Robert Frost did. And he came to a fork in the road and he traveled at the road less traveled in his poem. But there are three groups of people that we're going to notice who are at a crossroads in our lesson tonight. We're going to find Moses and the children of Israel who are at a crossroads with Moses' brother, a man by the uh, brother-in-law, excuse me, a man by the name of Hobab. Then when we shift our attention to the New Testament, we're going to find a preacher who is at a crossroads with some weary Christians. And then maybe in our lesson tonight, we might find ourselves who we might be at a crossroad. Maybe you are determined and you know the choice that you're making and you know the destination, but there's a lot of people who don't. And a lot of people who do not even realize that they need to make a choice. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, there's only two ways. One leads to destruction. The other leads to eternal life. And so we make a choice. And you might have already made the right choice. But I'm thinking that maybe you're at a crossroads with some of your friends and neighbors or even family members. And you need to help them as they are going to make a choice. So three groups of people at a fork in the road. The first was Moses and his brother-in-law, a man by the name of Hobab. We find their story in Numbers chapter 10. And in Numbers chapter 10, starting with verse 29, the Bible says, Now Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, We're setting out for the place which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will treat you well. For the Lord has promised good to Israel. At this point, the Bible says that Hobab said, I will not go, but I'm going to go back to my own land and to my relatives. And Moses said, please do not leave inasmuch as you know how we are to camp in the wilderness and you can be our eyes. And it shall be if you go with us, indeed it shall be that whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same we will do to you. See, Moses almost tugging at Hobab and saying, come and go with us. Now, Moses is led by the pillar of fire and the cloud. Moses has God's leading and he is following that. But Moses also has in Hobab a man who's been in the Sinai wilderness, a man who's trekked there, camped there, a man who's probably shepherded sheep and goats there, And he's a perfect guide. If you've ever been in those wilderness places where you need the outfitters and the guides, you know what a guy like Hobab is worth. And that's what Moses is doing on this occasion. But the invitation that Moses uses is, come with us, we'll treat you well. Because God has promised good to Israel. Now, at this point... We wonder why would Hobab not want to go with Moses? Well, it's obvious in the response, Hobab has relatives that are on the different road. Hobab also knows the things of this place. And I think Hobab even knows a little bit about the wilderness in Sinai. What's that wilderness like? Place you want to go camping? Place you want to stay for vacation a little bit longer? 
Oh, it's full of scorpions, isn't it? And serpents and other wild creatures. And it's a place of great, great thirst. There are no natural resources there. And so we could understand Hobab's reluctance. But let's focus on the invitation that Moses made in that gracious invitation. First of all, we need to focus on the foundation, the Lord. Brethren, when we see and appreciate and understand who God is, to understand His wisdom, that He knows all, there's not going to be anything that comes along and surprises God or catches Him off guard. When we know of God's power, that there is nothing God cannot do, nothing that God cannot come up with for the resources to be able to carry these people through that terrible, terrible wilderness. And then we know the character of God. It's one thing to be able to have wisdom. It's another thing to be able to have the resources. But then is the person you are following one who wants your best interest at heart? God's goodness. Right? All of those things we have in the Lord who has promised. That's what Israel had long ago. That's what you and I have. We can have this because God is faithful to His Word. The Hebrew writer again in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23 said, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For He who is promised is faithful. God is faithful and here in Hebrews chapter 6 in the passage we're going to read in a little bit there is the understanding that God is the one who has made this promise and He has sworn it with an oath. Two immutable things by which it's impossible for God to lie. And so because of that we can take the promise of God as sure and steadfast as sure and steadfast as the character of God Himself. And brethren, this is the foundation for our trust. It's not about how much faith I have. It's not how much faith that all of us together here might have. And all of us together with all of our faith, this is how we change things. No, we need to have faith in the God who changes things. And this is what is the foundation for our understanding of our trust. His word is unchangeable, unlike the word of men. You ever have somebody promise you something and they don't deliver? Now you kids don't think of your parents right now. <laughs> parents make promises. Sometimes and most time if they're good parents they're trying to follow through on those. Because parents are limited in resources aren't they? Parents can be limited in wisdom. I think about Jephthah who made a promise long ago. Lord, give me this victory. The first thing that comes out of my house, I'm going to offer to you. I wonder what he thought was going to come out of those doors, don't you? Because his daughter came out of those doors. Sometimes we make promises we don't need to make. But God is not like that. God doesn't make any blunder. And his words are unchangeable. We've heard a lot of promises from politicians, haven't we? Are they going to deliver? I don't know. I think some of them promise things they know they can't even deliver on. That's the way of men and that's the way of things in this world sometimes. But brethren, do not grow cynical about the God who makes the promises to us. His word is imperishable, unchangeable. And it is this foundation that we need to go to and rely on and understand. In the second place, as we think of this phrase, the Lord has promised. I want us to think a little bit about what a promise is. And as we think about what a promise is, again, I'm just stunned at God's amazing grace. We think in most times, in most instances, I think of amazing grace as what God has done with our past. God forgives our sins in His Son, Jesus Christ. That washes away my past. 
But we also need to consider what God does when He makes a promise. It is also amazing grace. You see, a promise is the exercise of an individual's free will to bind themselves to the word that they have said. It is about how we freely choose and make this promise. And as we understand and will keep that promise, it is also about all the things that are necessary in keeping that promise. Brother David mentioned uh, that I've got a younger son. He just graduated from college in May. He's looking for a job right now and he's real desperate for that. But he's getting married in August. And those two young people are going to come together out of their love for one another to make a promise to each other. That's what a vow is, a wedding vow. It's a promise to each other. And it's that promise that they have to freely give up their independent life to now live as husband and wife. And it is where in the freedom that they have to limit themselves, they are instead going to be able to enjoy and count on one of the greatest blessings and privileges that God gives us in this earth as we think of what the marriage relationship is. But it comes to mind that God made promises first. The Lord has promised. And God in His promising has now also allowed men to make promises as we are made in the image of God. And I like this. This means that I'm not just a product of my genetic makeup, the X and Y chromosomes. I'm not just a product of the environment that I was raised in. I'm not just a product of the social forces that are all out here. I'm not just a product of my parents and all of their good and negative attributes. It means I'm a free individual. I'm not determined in this life, nor am I fated that this is the only thing I can do. But what happens when I exercise myself in making a promise is that I am following in the image of God. And that, in a sense, is something that is uniquely human. I've got a great dog at home. She's getting old now. But you know that dog has never promised to stay with me. (laughs) Now she stays, I feed her, I treat her nice. But you know if the criminal that broke into my house might come in and say I'll treat you nice and I'll feed you too, that dog might just go. (laughs) I've got a computer at home. That computer has never promised to be loyal to me. And in fact... (laughs) That computer's let me down in the most crucial time, David. (laughs) You see, we're uniquely human and following the divine image when we can make a promise. Now, what is God doing when He's promised? He's reaching out into the future that is, as far as man knows, unknown, unpredictable. And God is pinpointing and saying, here at this place, in this time, I will fulfill. And God does so even if he has to die to fulfill it. Isn't that amazing grace? And the whole human future rests on God's power of promising. It doesn't rest on what climate change is going to happen. It doesn't rest on what might happen in the Middle East. It doesn't rest on what might happen to the stock market. It all rests on God's power of promising. Then in the third place, what has God promised? 
Moses said, come go with us because the Lord has promised good things to Israel. What good things did Israel receive? They were liberated from slavery in Egypt. That's a good thing. But that liberation was just the first stage. They were promised the land, what? Flowing with milk and honey. You'll have houses there you didn't build. You'll have trees and vineyards there that you didn't plant. And you'll reap that harvest. You'll enjoy that land flowing with milk and honey because that's the land I promised to give you. And God fulfilled that promise. God also promised to them and graciously provided for them even when they were on that wilderness journey in that terrible howling wilderness, as Scripture calls it, He was giving them manna from above. And the water was flowing from the flinty rock. And there in these blessings we realize that the nature of most of these promises were physical to the Israelites. In this they were temporary, also in this, they were limited. They were basically for the Jews only. But we see also God's graciousness as here Moses is reaching out to Hobab and his family. And he says, you can also have these blessings as well. Kind of prefiguring a little bit, so to speak, of God's universal plan. And brethren, when we contrast that, we realize that there are better promises. In fact, this is what uh, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, uh, that Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant established on better promises. And it is these better promises that you and I are the recipients of, and we are the ones who look forward to enjoying these, pres these blessings and these promises a little bit for now in the present, but nothing like what it's going to be yet revealed to us. Salvation. But God be thanked that you were once the servants or slaves of sin, but yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that which, which was delivered to you. Romans 6, 17. Brethren, there's a slavery that's worse than physical slavery in this world. And that's the slavery to sin. There is salvation promised. There is a heavenly home that is promised. In John chapter 14, you remember Jesus met with his disciples. And Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Brethren, we have the promise of a heavenly home with the presence of God the Father and Jesus the Son. We have the provisions that God gives to us in this life. In a little bit, there, or in a little prefigure of a way, they're very similar to those provisions that God made for Israel in the wilderness. What did Jesus say to that woman at the well? Remember in John chapter 4? If you knew who it was who was talking to you, you would ask of him and he would give you the waters of life. Later in John chapter 6, as Jesus had multiplied the bread and the fishes for those people on that occasion, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life come down out of heaven. Brethren, God provides us the true provisions of this world. Yes, materially and the things that we look for, but in the spiritual place of the sustenance and the source of the vital life we need found in Jesus himself. These are the reason why the blessings in Christ are better because they're spiritual blessings. As Paul points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse, 20, Paul, verse 25, Paul says, Now everyone who competes, competes for a prize that is temporal in nature. 
or the person who competes has to be temperate in all things. He says they do it for a temporary or a perishable crown. But we do it for an imperishable crown. Any Miami Heat fans here? Hey, <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I'm a little bit jealous. I'm a Cleveland Cavaliers fan and LeBron left us. <laughs> but they've got the crown, don't they? Two years in a row. Where's that crown going to be in a thousand years? Will there be anyone who knows, anyone who would remember? But where are you going to be in a thousand years and with the imperishable crown to come? That's what we need to see and realize as we might be standing at the fork in the road or we might be needing to help someone else who's at the fork in the road. There's an eternal life to come. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18, While we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary. They're going to pass away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Brethren, these are the good things that God has provided. And they are the good things that God has provided to all men. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him might not perish but might have everlasting life. God so loved the world. These blessings aren't list, limited to one tribe of people but they are for all, all people. Well, there were first century Christians who were also at a crossroad. And real quickly... I know I've got to be drawing close to our time, but let's turn to Hebrews chapter 6. And notice what the preacher was trying to help these weary Christians to choose and make sure that they understood the choice that they were making. He says in Hebrews chapter 6, starting with verse 11, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but you imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he, that is Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise for men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. And thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability or the unchangeable nature of his counsel. He confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation we who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Notice with me here, the Hebrew writer is sharing this passage and talking about the promises of God to help these Christians to persevere. This was their motivation found in the promises of God. A motivation for perseverance. Perseverance is just big a word that someone has once said. It's the hard work you do after you get tired of all the hard work you've already done. You keep on keeping on even when you get, want to give up. These Christians were tempted to give up as they stood at the crossroads. The temptation came because of the Roman oppression that was coming on Christians. And for Christians who had come out of Judaism, there was a temptation, I can go back into Judaism and you know what? My home and my family are secure. I don't have to worry about the Romans coming in and confiscating my possessions, taking my children and selling them into slavery. 
I don't have to worry about the Romans persecuting us and uh, having to do uh, the, all the things of hard labor and other kind of things that the Romans forced Christians to do. And I don't have to endure the persecution, the put-downs, what my friends might say about me. I just drift back into Judaism. There was a choice. And there were two roads. And the Christian one was a harder one. Just like that wilderness one was a harder one. But it was all about the destination. Where is it going to end? Yeah, they could drift back into Judaism, but Judaism was over. It was where they needed to stand faithful to God in their alliance and confession with Christ. And so there was a call to imitate the faithful. Faithful Abraham, a long ago, to whom God made these promises. What did Abraham receive in those promises? I like how the Hebrew writer puts it in a few chapters later in chapter 11 and verse 13. He said, but these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having greeted them from afar and embraced them, and having confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I want you to think about this. How many of the promises that God made to Abraham did Abraham see fulfilled in his lifetime? Remember, get up out of your land and from your kindred and go to the land I shall show you, Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. There's basically a child promise. You'll have children as numerous as the stars and the sand. There was a land promise. And then there was the promise of the seed. In thy seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. What did Abraham see of all those promises? He saw Isaac after 25 years. He never saw the children of Israel in their millions that Moses was leading out of Egypt. Never saw that at all. But he saw Isaac. What did Abraham have of the promised land? Only a burial plot for his wife Sarah. Later on that land would be given to Israel and they would have it and the promises of God were fulfilled. But Abraham didn't see them except from afar. He died in faith. And he never saw Jesus on this side of, that side of eternity. And someone might say, well, I guess Abraham was pretty duped by God, wasn't he? God made all those promises and Abraham died and he didn't even see him. Brethren, before we get too judgmental, <laughs> first of all, which one of those promises failed? None of them. They all came true. And God never said it was going to be in Abraham's lifetime. But they all came true. Now you and I, what might happen? I might die in faith, right? But if I die in faith, what does that change in the promises of God? Not a single thing. In fact, I'll see them and realize them. And so here's the power of motivation and the power for living. And here's a message for those Christians who were at a crossroad, but maybe Christians today who were at a crossroad, where you're wondering, when am I going to see these things? I still struggle. I still have pain. I still go through all these kind of things. Is God's promise just an empty promise for me? Or are the promises of God still Sure, in the character of God. And so the motivation to persevere and the motivation to keep on and the sure, reliable anchor of the soul is for you and me because we know where that anchor is. It's beyond the curtain in the heavenly of heavenlies. It's where Jesus has gone. 
is where Jesus is now. And he's not a dead Savior. He's the risen, living Savior at the right hand of God. He is our man in heaven, to use the title of a book, pleading our case before the throne of God. So, brethren, which will you choose? I'm confident tonight I'm speaking to the cream of the crop. And I know the choice that you have made. I want to encourage you to persevere and to keep on staying in that right way. But brethren, I know that we all have friends, neighbors, family members who need to make that choice. I think we could do nothing better than echo Moses' invitation. Come and go with us. The Lord has promised good things. Not only to Israel then, but good things to those who will follow him today. Help your friends and neighbors make that choice. Help them to know the God who loves them, who sent his son for them. And let's make that gracious invitation to others. I thank you for your attention tonight. I hope you'll look at these things that we've studied. I hope it'll be a great encouragement to you in your faithfulness to the God who has promised.